Hey everyone, Greg and Lucy here to Hello. bring you our spoiler-filled review of Mindhunter Season 2. Now we're going to break down the ending for you, look over all the real-life serial killers that we saw this season, and of course, go over what we think is going to happen maybe for Season 3 in the future. Also, make sure you've seen all the episodes because we're going to be spoiling the crap out of it. Let's jump in. Okay, let's jump into our initial reactions now for this show. Well, we loved it. Let's throw that out there right yeah. now. But what I love about this show is that it's skillfully aware of this strange love that humankind has for criminal behavior. And it really just shines a light on this growing, at least in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, of the celebrity complex. Mm. Everybody wants to be famous. But some people do it in a really awful way by killing other people. But that's what I love oh. about Mindhunter is that it explores this aberrant behavior, mm -hmm. but without glorifying it. And I think part of yeah. that is due to the Fincher-esque, just detached, cold filmmaking. Every shot is so beautiful. But I think the reason that I love season two way more than I love season one, and I love season one a lot, is because in season two, they really give you more to latch onto with regard to the central characters. Oh, absolutely. We've lifted the mask from evil and are peering into the very mind of the criminal. Our little unit thanks you. Sir. Okay, let's talk about Holden, of course, mm -hmm. uh, last season's main character. Not exactly this season's main character. Relegated. Very much so. A bit. I think that was definitely for a good reason. Holden, while the technically the brainchild behind the BSU, is a difficult character to sympathize with because he seems very uh, just unattached and very a uh, kind of a blank slate and just you know, not really much characterization there it's in season one. And also he had the girlfriend who I think annoyed pretty much everyone because she was just there for. So maybe the writers were like, okay, that's enough of that. That's enough. No more exposition from these guys. Well, he ended last season with his panic attack when he was going to visit Ed Kemper. Yep. And he starts off this season, you know, it feels like the panic disorder that he's diagnosed with is going to play a huge role. I thought role. it was going to be big, yeah. Uh, they make a very big deal out of it, you know, uh, Tench is saying to him, man up, so you think it's going to cause more of a rift between him and the other investigators, and, you know, Wendy and Tench talking about him behind his back. Mm -hmm. So the first couple of episodes, sure, and then he gets Valium and it's fine. Everything's cool now. Yeah. All right. Uh, I knew the second they, they talked to Ed Kemper again, I was like, oh, okay. All right, never mind. That, yeah. We're just going to just throw that storyline under the bed. That's cool. how easy it is to cure acute mental disorders like panic disorder, apparently. <sighs> so that was disappointing. However, I do feel that moving the eye away from Holden mm -hmm. and onto a more sympathetic character like Tench, we'll talk about him in a second, was a very, very smart move and really gelled this season together. Absolutely. Um, Holden, though, he did still have some very good moments. There was, you know, the moments where, so he spends all of season one, you know, desperately trying to prove to everyone that he's right and that profiling is the way forward. And that's yeah, what he's the always like, doing. I'm the smartest guy in the room. These idiots have no clue what's going on. So I love that, you know, he has this arc of wanting and being tenacious and wanting to prove that he's right. And then at the start of this season, especially when Gunn gets the top job of, Mm -hmm. Him being told that he's the golden boy and that he was right all along and that he was getting funding and ah. everything he needs, but then only to be knocked back again because he's proven he's fallen short in other areas and he's not the team player. Politics, the one thing that he didn't think that was going to happen to him for mm -hmm. season two. So Holden being, not necessarily sidelined, but Holden being mm -hmm. less in the spotlight, I think was a very smart move for season two. And it actually kind of endeared me to his character a lot more because he was going, he wasn't just this very blank, you know, steadfast man like season one. He had flaws and flaws are what make characters great. But from now on, it's my rules. If I tell you to shut your mouth, you shut your mouth. So whereas Holden, his turmoil is coming from internal factors more than anything, you have on the flip side Tench, who is the main, I guess, point of view character for this season. Yep. And he is a man who, I, he in, he was endeared to everyone in season one for sure. He's but, now the fatherly figure, yeah. the white collar, let's do this, that hard brass exterior but interior, he's got the heart of gold. He's a, he's a bear, he's a, he's a big cuddly bear that you just wanna, you know, tell tell him everything's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. But everything that's happening to, to Tench in this season is all Oof. external and it's, it's so fascinating, it's so well acted to see this man who, 
His family life is falling apart. He is being pulled between the politics of work, between his actual really stressful job. And it's interesting because it also plays into the time period as well, because it's still the very, while attitudes are certainly changing, men at that time, you are still very much expected to be the businessman, the family man. Do you it are all. expected to yeah. have this poker face where everything is fine and you are just getting things done. And he pulled it off. And he pulled it off, but you can, <sighs> but you can still see him struggling. And that's why, again, flaws make characters great. He can't hold it all together. And ultimately at the end of the season, oh. it falls apart for him. And so I'm so excited to see where that goes. But overall, season two was Tench's season. Now, talking about Bill, we can't forget about Nancy. We're gonna talk about Brian a little bit later, but mm -hmm. for now, let's stick to Nancy and just how it's a tragic character for her. And just, yeah. and I felt that, and it's very real too for the ideas of how a parent tries to, you know, think there's nothing wrong with their child. They just need, uh, there's a quick fix to everything. And that's yeah. not the case that she would find out this season. I mean, it's like she, she just wants to have this, as you said, just this quiet, normal life. And she thinks the hardship of her life you know, adopting Brian is over because they have Brian and they are living this blissful mm -hmm. life in the suburbs and she just wants to desperately be normal. But it's kind of like this illusion's been shattered yeah. maybe with Tench starting in the BSU. She begins to realize that life isn't all happiness and roses. It's, criminality is insidious and just part of your culture and part of your community in ways mm -hmm. that you don't recognize. Yeah. And so for her, you know, it's completely shattered and begins seeping in. So you have, you know, uh, Tension Season 1 accidentally bringing things home and Brian finding them. Mm -hmm. And that's exposing her to things that she's not familiar with. And it kind of it speaks to the whole season and the message of the season of the celebrity status of serial killers. Mm -hmm. And that they weren't that big of a deal. And then, you know, the floodgates opened and it's all you can see and all you can hear and all you can read about. And for Nancy, it would be uncomfortable because it's, coming into her life and then it happens you know the incident with brian and those kids and then you know the murder in the house that she's the realtor for and that was her you know big step into independence she's been mm -hmm. a stay-at-home mom for years and now her the... one big job out of there and now she doesn't yeah. even want to go back there to that she doesn't want anything to do with that and she yeah. hits the eject button by the end of the season she can't even have a normal barbecue with her neighbors because no. as soon as they find out what what bill does it's Oh, tell us about that, tell us about that. Even with the child psychologist. Yeah. It's every uh, aspect of her life is now tainted by it. And one of the great things about Fincher's work mm -hmm. in general is just watching the background characters, yes. watching everything going on in the background, people walking around. You can still see their eyes, even if it's mm -hmm. out of focus. I love that. And she was a big part of that. And, and just the way as well, I'd love to talk about the, the way that she falls apart, because again, it's the same. It's you need to hold it all together. You yeah. just want to carry on like normal, protect Brian, it's fine. And yeah. then she has no support from her husband to, due to factors outside of his control and he's doing the best he can. And you can see her, she has no support within the community because they've all just gone, oh, nope, mm -hmm. you are Brian's mother. So it's just a tough time for everyone involved. And you just see her unravel very, very slowly. You know, her hair oh. would be a little bit unkempt. She would be drinking, yeah. she'd just say, I need a glass of wine. Then, you know, she's just sat outside staring into the middle distance, just smoking. I'm gonna go to the mall. How long are you gonna be? Don't know, don't care, need something. And so, oh, it's so good. All right, let's move on to Wendy because of her sexuality and how she's trying to deal with the fact that she wants to come out. Mm -hmm. It's the early 80s. Within so a male dominated place like the FBI, uh -huh. where even the mention of her sexuality, they think that she made it up. They bring up the DSM. Mm hmm. Oh, the DSM. Yep. Diagnostics and statistical manual that psychologists and psychiatrists use to categorize um, behavior, mental disorders, deviant behavior. Mm -hmm. Can you tell I've got a psychology degree? <laughs> Homosexuality is a deviance. Actually, it's been removed from the DSM as a disorder and changed to a sexual orientation disturbance. Sounds much better. There's even this cringy moment, this super cringy moment with uh, Ted where he pushes her into a date with the another finance gentleman. guy too. Uh, oh, it's very insidious. It's you knew it was coming. I, I just love the way that Ted, uh, when he pushes her in there and he just looks back at the guy like, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, all right, all right. Have a nice night, everyone. I mean, the thing is as well, so in season one, she breaks up with um, her older uh, partner who she was in a relationship for with everyone for years. Everyone knows she's single. And she's single. But then in this season, you know, she's kind of getting her independence. She's putting herself out there. 
she, uh, you know, she makes the first move um, with Kay at yeah. the bar and, you know, you think things are going to be great for her and then exploring that relationship with her, part of it is like she can't decide who she needs to be. She wants to yeah. be this freewheeling go-getter and then she meets someone who is the epitome of a freewheeling go-getter who, you know, left her marriage, left her son, lies to her ex and everything and lives in a mm -hmm. less than ideal place with a temporary job and then she realizes, no, that's not what she wants either. She wants control mm -hmm. and boundaries. So she goes out of her comfort zone and then sort of brings herself back in again. And also, Wendy was not allowed, she was put on the bench. She was not allowed to go out and do any more profiling but cases. The couple that she did, she did better than Greg, who we'll talk about in a second, who completely <laughs> choked. You know, she was competent yep. and she was able to get things out of the killers. Now she does semi come out yeah. to Henley mm. in the interview process, but Greg takes that as, oh, that's good acting. Yeah, good that's job. a great way of adapting on the fly and just, you know. And then you can tell that she's starting to, the wheels are turning in her head where she's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. That was complete acting on my part. Good yeah. job. And you can see her react, um, I think out of everyone, she is the character who has to adapt more to the situations that are put in front of her, especially when yeah. she's dealing with gun, when she's uh, talking in the interviews. And I think oh. Tench is the only one who really- He may know. Gets her and she, both of them feel more open with each other than certainly with Holden and certainly with Greg. Old relegated Greg. Parental figures, yeah. I feel like, for just the FBI in general. Mm -hmm. I think both of them are more world-wise in how things work. Absolutely. Very, very glad that Jim Barney was back for this season, because poor hey. guy, he would have been such a great addition to the BSU. They, I'm glad he got a chance to shine. They immediately bring up the interview from last season when he didn't get the job and figure out what happened there. And all, oh, yeah. how's, how's the, the guy doing? About as well as nepotism gets you. <laughs> such a good line. So Barney played a very big role in this season, helping out. He's kind of bridges the gap for people who don't know. He's, I'm loath to say he's kind of there for exposition. Yes. But he provides the relatable, understandable character who can portray just how awful Atlanta and Georgia was in the 70s and 80s to mm -hmm. a black man and why, you know, why this case was getting to the stage where you know, over 10 children had gone missing or been found dead and no one was doing anything. He's there to break it to not only the BSU and the FBI, but also to the audience who might not necessarily understand yeah. why it was how it was. Outside of that, when it comes to racial tensions, we have to look at the uh, women of the missing children, the mothers. Yes. They deal with the aspects of everything involved with politics mm -hmm. and how it's been wiped under the rug. Um, but with, when it comes to Jim in general, he's there for mostly, I think, the police department mm -hmm. aspect of everything and just how it works just in, yeah. in, in Atlanta at the time and how rough it was. Yeah, because I mean, the thing is we take for granted these days that you have things like databases with fingerprints and mm -hmm. uh, you have police departments that talk to each other. Back then, police departments across states wouldn't necessarily talk to each other. And it was Quick, so, hang up. so much more political. Um, and that's why some cases, you know, you had things that would go on across states and just yeah. would never be, never be sorted. But then, you know, the police worked, started to work together more and more. I am all on board of Jim returning for future seasons, yes. part of the BSU. I think that should happen going yeah. forward. He's he's prepared, yep. you know, he reads the case notes, he proves himself in that interview, you know, he brings the peanut butter cups because he's noticed this one detail um, mm -hmm. of the picture of the guy in the cell. He does his homework. He does his homework. It was William. It was uh, yeah. William. Yep. And he, you know, he's just a very, stable person, I think. I, I mean, I would say the one criticism of him is that he's maybe a little one dimensional, just in the fact that you only get one reference to his life outside his work. I hope they don't just keep him for this season, though, only for that part, and they bring him into the BSU for next year, because yeah. at the end of the day, this still is a fictional show. Yes. The accident has nothing to do with the murders. They don't want to hear logic. Only your excuses. Okay, now let's spend the next hour talking about Greg, of course. Aww. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Greg with three G's. Uh, so he's the, uh, he, I'm sorry, he's the FBI snitch at the moment still. Yeah. So he's really put in the corner. Uh, but I he has he moments was, to shine. He was kind of put in the corner through the situation by which he got that job, right? Yes. You know, it was they through already nepotism. Hated him. <laughs> it, you know, he wasn't the best candidate for the job, but because, you know, 
more powerful men got him that job, he feels like he owes them, which is why he was the snitch. But unfortunately, in a unit where trust is key, trust between you and the partner when you're interviewing, and mm -hmm. you know you can trust that person, like Holden does, to go off, of course. but ultimately getting results. If you have someone like Greg who you can't trust, I just want to say great performance by John Tuttle. Yes. It's all in mannerisms and the scene with Henley and how Henley's turned away from him and how he just, he, he knows he failed yeah, he <laughs> knows seconds he did, into yeah. that interview. And, but his just mannerisms of just standing there, the eye contact mm -hmm. and it, 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 he, I loved it. Loved every second of it, including the scene where, of course, it's, it's going to be a running theme, I feel like, for seasons going further where, um, hey, Greg, do you mind uh, just leaving the room for a second? Yeah. Would you give us a minute, please? All right, let's talk about Ted Gunn. He wants results. Yeah. But is that it? What else is going on with him? He is a slimy chess master. Yes, he is. And when we were talking about his character the other day, we think that he kind of, because he wants all the recognition, it very much mirrors the themes of what the serial killers are wanting. Celebrity. Celebrity. So, you know, you've got Dennis Rader writing letters. You have... Uh -huh. um, all of them just wanting to correct the narrative and make sure that they are the heroes because they fantasize about it for so long. And you can imagine that someone like Gunn, who spent years within the FBI fantasizing about what it would be like to get that top job. But the thing is, is isn't it when they- when He tells Wendy yeah. he didn't want the job or yeah. he had another position and he wanted this job yeah. with the BSU. Because it would be something that would, I mean, with Shepard's retirement, uh -huh. you get your picture on the wall regardless, but What's gonna make people remember you? And that's something like the, the BSU. BSU. And that's what he wants. He wants legacy. And he will do anything in his power. And it seems like he has a lot of power to yeah. do that. You, you know, want Charles Manson? Sure, I'll get weeks. you Charles Manson. Three weeks. Um, I'll get you a new place to sit. I'll get you XYZ, I'll get you staff. But I want results and I want them within my time frame. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna insert ourselves into all these cases that we would ordinarily never be involved in. And so, it's great that you have that mix between uh, him and Holden, where Holden still thinks he's the golden boy, but he's very, very shrewd. He knows that Holden is all about ego, and he plays into that, but he also has <laughs> Wendy and Tenge, and mm -hmm. he's going, no, 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 you keep an eye on him. Yeah. He can't ever, if his ego is shattered by thinking that he's failed, he might not be as good. He might have an, I mean, he doesn't know about the breakdowns, but you know, it could, damage him and damage his effectiveness and his intuition. And so it's a really interesting game that he's playing. I just think he's a real snake. Can you help me do that? I'll certainly try. Okay, let's jump into the real life serial killers of season two now. And our very own Meg Downing rounded up every single serial killer profiled and examined for Mindhunter season two. And she stacked them up next to their real life case files. Check that out right now on GameSpot. So when you're pulling from a pool of people like serial killers and criminals, mm -hmm. you have a very interesting mix. And I think when you're looking at the people who they have in Mindhunter season two, mm -hmm. we identified some themes that kind of bring everyone together. Why did they pick the killers they picked for this season? Yeah, so sexuality. Of course. The first one, you know, crimes that are sexually motivated, um, people who are confused about their sexuality and how, mm -hmm. um, you know, the times are obviously changing, but not for everyone and everywhere at different places will have different uh, reactions to sexuality and homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And that's a big conflict and that can act out in certain ways with other mitigating circumstances. Yes, and this is like the beginning to that too, when it mm -hmm. seems like, because remember, this is early 80s. This is before the AIDS crisis. So we're just watching that egg crack right now. Mm -hmm. Also, recognition and perception. The Controlling FBI. that narrative. Yes, politics. Who won? There's good guys and there's bad guys. The FBI always wants you to know, hey, we're the good guys, we caught the bad guy, now let's move on, that's it. And it doesn't work out that way. No. And we know this season shows that, that you know there are cracks to this system mm -hmm. and they last. And as we know, from if you just look up anything on any of these serial killers, we know that this goes on for mm -hmm. years to come, yeah. even till today. And yeah, the FBI is making these profiles, but they're not always correct. You no. know, they've had some luck with season one and uh, well, within the, confines of the show in season one yes. the profiles that they were making were always accurate and always helped catch the killer and everything and it was fine but in season mm -hmm. two when they're presented with this case the Atlanta child murders 
and it doesn't pan out the way they want, but they still need everyone to know that the FBI- We the have ones, this covered. We've got it covered, we've got it under control. And so there's controlling the narrative from their point of view, but also from the view of the killers themselves. You have BTK, who he wasn't happy with the way that the media were portraying his case. And so he would write in and go, I'm gonna name myself. Um, BTK. You, BTK, I'm gonna have my own symbol. It's, you know, things you see with the Zodiac Killer. Son of Sam. Son of Sam. They want to have this narrative that they can control because they've been fantasizing about this for years. And that's another thing they mention is that Fantasy. people like Kemper, mm -hmm. they were fantasizing about killing long before they actually started doing it. It's all a fantasy and that's one of the cool things I love about Megan, just the, the process in general is like from the FBI's point of view, you want to get them in that fantasy. Mm -hmm. You want to get your, when you're doing the interview or anything, you got to get them in that fantasy first. You don't just have them go, all right, who did it? When, and when where were you this night? You got to get them in the fantasy first. and that played yeah. off really well, even this season. Yeah, don't they mention it with BTK, even though his first murder with the Otero family, it's unpredictable. He didn't know that the husband would be home, that there would be a dog, mm -hmm. but yet because he'd fantasized about it for so long. He didn't care, he, he knew what he knew, he had it all taken care of. He methodical and he could uh -huh. still do it. And so it's controlling that narrative based on your fantasy. And finally, because this is the Atlanta case, mm -hmm. uh, it's race. Race is a big part of this season. And of course, the Klan, how they bring up the Klan and how they just on camera explicitly tell everyone over and over again, like, hey, we have to do these things in private because yeah. obviously there may be a few uh, people who work for the police department who either know someone or are friends with someone, a family member to someone, yeah. or possibly themselves are part of the Klan. Like the guy uh, who doesn't want to print the leaflet. I that, love that. I love how the, unclear that is. All Holden wants to do is solve the case and he just wants everything taken care of from the police. Because he's like, you, you're the guy. You're the yeah. ones who should be taking care of this. And then we have this one bumbling, we don't even know oh, if he's just, a, a permit, is he an idiot? You need a work order, you need a requisition. They do a great job because you're not sure, yeah. is he just being an idiot or is he just being lazy? Mm -hmm. Or is he trying to slow down this case because of the clan? Mm -hmm. Great work, guys. Ugh. Bringing up the clan without explicitly showing or confirming, you know, there's no they, one in Was hoods there any there. wide hoods? Not one. No, I, don't think I there didn't, was one. No, but they, they, you know, when they go to that dinner to meet the um, Slayton, to meet the district attorney, mm -hmm. and they make Jim and the uh, the other FBI put them into a room, into a different room because it's just the subtle things, like you said about I earlier, just, Fincher yeah. in the background, the eyes. Mm -hmm. It's just people going, the people's reactions. What? It's so subtle, on. but it's so unnerving and so, uh, it's, it's really well done. It's, so you don't have to wear the white hood to no. be a racist. Nope. Let's start off with David Berkowitz, AKA Son of Sam. Now Berkowitz did initially try to explain his crimes away by blaming them on demonic possession. However, Berkowitz didn't first admit that his demon hoax was a big fat lie to a pair of BSU profilers, but in a press conference in 1979. If you look at footage and pictures of the real David Berkowitz, the show got him spot on. Perfect, uh, with prosthetics for the face. It is frightening. Those, those brows, man. Then you've got William Henry Hans, and it's actually quite difficult to determine just how realistic his portrayal is, because the real Hans was executed back in 1994 via the electric chair. But a cool uh, thing that ties the real Hans to the show is that he was profiled by Robert K. Ressler, who was the actual inspiration for Bill Tench. And all of the weird details of his crimes, yep, even the invention of the forces of evil, they are all based on real things that he told the police force, and he thought he would get away with that. William Pierce Jr. Yes, he had an IQ of around 70, and the show would highlight on this with Holden's dissatisfaction with the interview process. Now, he potentially suffered a traumatic brain injury as a child, but there's no proof of that whatsoever. Now, Mindhunter did actually get the facts right about his sweet tooth. Now, in the show, it came in a photo of Pierce in his cell surrounded by junk food, the same photo that is shown in the episode to corroborate Barney's tactics. Now, on that photo, we think it might be photoshopped, though, on the show. His face looked like a kind of cut out and look more like the actual actor. So yeah. I think I think that part was was photoshopped in. But they did use a lot of real photos of, you know, Manson and stuff. So nice little mix of fact and fiction. Yeah. Then you've got Elmer Henley. So you might actually recognize the actor. He was best known as young Ned Stark from Game of Thrones season six. My favorite episode. The Tower of Joy, uh, played by Robert Aramayo. So Henley is the man responsible for killing the Candyman, Dean Coral. So Dean Coral uh, worked at a chocolate factory. He was, you know, an even more evil Willy Wonka. He had uh, oh. Henley capture and, or, or convince 
young boys to come and then Coral would rape them and kill them. And then eventually Henley killed Coral. So many of the details of um, Coral's life and murders can be corroborated and verified by another accomplice that they had who's called David Brooks. Brooks actually verified that Henley did way more than just lure Coral's victims to him. He often participated and apparently enjoyed the act of killing himself because as they say in the show, why would you keep doing it if you didn't like doing it, if you didn't get some pleasure out of it. Mm -hmm. So the show implies that Henley defended himself when Cole turned on him, uh, but it turns out that Cole turned on him because Henley brought a girl. Two people, Two people. brought a girl as well, and mm -hmm. he was pissed off. Yes, and so Cole actually tied up Henley, Henley managed to get loose and shot him. Um, yeah, it's a real, that whole case. Dark shit. Is super dark, but it's super interesting if you read up on it. <laughs> This anger that you're feeling, Agent Ted, this is just the anger that you got for you. Find someone else to put your cell phone. I'm tired of being your goat. I'm tired of being your reflection. You're not my reflection. I've always been yours. I've been in your cell since I was eight years old. Now that face may look very familiar to you if you saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because mm -hmm. it is the very same actor playing Charles Manson, mm -hmm. Damon Harriman. Now the cool thing about this season when it comes to real life interpretation of the character, they use Charles Manson's real music this season. And it's extremely haunting in the episode. It's also available on Spotify. Fun fact about Charlie Manson there. There you go. Yeah, there's a lot of videos of Manson and they really nailed his just very bizarre way of speaking. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you kind of, I, I imagine, so they did it for Kemper in season one, the side by side, there has to be one of Manson because he really Easily. nailed his utterly bizarre mannerisms. Um, and yeah, bringing his music into it. Just come and say you love me. Now Tex Watson shows up right after that and he's the only member of the Manson family to appear in season two aside from Charles himself. And of course Watson was one of the people who actually participated in the Tate LaBianca murders. Then you got Paul Bateson, who was interviewed by both Wendy and Greg in episode six. So Bateson was only actually ever convicted of one murder in 1977, but he was strongly suspected of killing six other men in New York City in the 70s, dismembering their bodies, throwing putting them, them in bags. Yep, and putting them into the Hudson River. He vehemently denied taking part, even though in the show they said that we heard you told a friend that you said that you did it. Um, Bateson was actually released from prison in 2003. His whereabouts are currently unknown. However, people think he may have died in 2012, at least looking at his social security records. Do you know why we pulled you over, Mr. Williams? I guess it must be about all those boys. And then finally, Wayne Williams, the main bad for season two, I guess we can say. Mm -hmm. Now, Williams was convicted of, let me check, two. Let's count them again, one more time. Two adults. Ugh. Now the 20 plus murdered children were never formally pinned to him. To this day, the case remains unsolved and there's new evidence and investigation methods being employed right now in the year 2019. They have just reopened the case. Yes, they have. And obviously that does have to do with the show. This happens a lot all the time, but at the end of the day, I'm happy they're reopening the case. And Williams to this day, despite the years he spent in prison, maintains his own innocence on all counts. Now the Wayne Williams story arc feels so much like Zodiac. If you've seen Zodiac, you know how this is going down and how they're spreading out all the clues here for you and they're giving you a, what do you think happened here yeah. kind of thing. They also, they don't forget about the clan uh, because again, even with the case itself and looking at the 20 plus victims, uh, they suspect that possibly the clan had, may have jumped on board at yeah. somewhere around the, maybe the number 15 or so. Mm -hmm. And they also mentioned Wayne's father and if he had any play whatsoever yeah. into this whole entire thing. Why was he looking at flights to Exactly, South how America? much did he know? Was he com just complicit or did he actually mm -hmm. help out? So they leave little breadcrumbs for you to yeah. just put together. And this is what I love about the show because this honestly with William's character and the, the whole play on what everything that's going on with the race, the clan, this felt a lot like Chinatown ending. Forget about it, Jack, it's mm. Chinatown. And I, that's what I love about this show. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about one extra, our fan fave, I guess. Mm -hmm. right, actually, I'll just bring that up. Why yeah. do you think they brought back Ed Kemper? Just for the acting? Because fan I, fave. Hey, I'm all for it. Because I, so good. he didn't fit to the profile that they were looking at for every other mm -hmm. uh, killer, which is why, again, they only bring him up because they were there to talk to someone else in the first yeah. place. So let's just have a quick on uh, chat with um, our good old friend, Ed Kemper, and he does an incredible 
incredible job again. Yeah. Kemper as a character, as a person in real life is just morbidly fascinating. And mm -hmm. so I'm personally glad that we got to see a little bit more of him. However, I think the spotlight if there is going to be, you know, for season three, will certainly shift to someone like Manson. Because oh, yes. he represents the unpredictable, mm -hmm. whereas Kemper is the eloquent and the, the predictable, not predictable, but the controlled, I would say. I remember Kemper, he always brings up, I'm the guy you caught, but what about the guys you didn't catch just mm -hmm. yet, or a little bit smarter than that? We know killers don't have the tools to manage real life. They come from marginalized backgrounds, they break under the pressure of what they've done, they make mistakes. Seems to me everything you know about serial killers has been gleaned from the ones who've been caught. Let's get into the ending and let's talk about Brian. Let's start there because, oh boy, this, uh, it paid off so well and it is so disturbing. I absolutely think that this is probably the, the best thing they could have done for this show and bring you in as an audience as also a profiler. In the background, if you're paying attention, you start to notice that things are happening here that are going to lead to something bigger down the line, and it paid off. Yeah, there's the, I mean, the brief mention of uh, killers who wet themselves a lot as children, mm -hmm. and then Brian wets himself. Yep. There are other things like uh, the scene when the social worker comes and they're having breakfast, and there's just a fly. And I, and I feel like it's just because it's Fincher, and I don't know if he directed that actual episode, but because his fingerprints are on it, it you can't overlook even the smallest thing. And the fly mm -hmm. could be a dead animal. animal. He's they, burying he's animals in the backyard. In the uh, yep, I believe that. Yeah, and just, you know, staring, being unable to connect with other children, with other people his age. He withdraws from his parents, yeah. even though he's withdrawn from his parents the prior season because they were setting this up mm -hmm. in season one. Oh uh, man, uh, mm -hmm. where do they go from here with this character? And they uh, say that they have no idea what home he came from, what he's seen, what unknown trauma he's been through, and it's. Mm -hmm. I love that they are playing with and toying with the expectations of us of the viewer from like what we've seen in the show, what we think we know about criminals, and yeah, it's really good. And what is his only line of dialogue this season? It's on dead animals. He, um, Come now, on, man. a little on the nose uh, mm -hmm. for the story itself. You didn't need it, but again, they're trying to paint the picture here for this kid. Um, now, it's creepy. I don't know if they're actually going to stick with this going farther, or he's going to become the next like Dexter or anything like that, or a little Norman Bates or anything like that. I think. I think that would be too on the Too nose. far, yeah. But just the fact that they're even toying with that is very, very interesting and very compelling. Now let's move on to BTK. Blind, Raider. torture, kill. Dennis Rader. I, the thing that I loved about him being in season one is that even in the credits, he's never referred to as Dennis Rader, never referred to as BTK. He's called, I think, ADT Serviceman. Yep. Uh, the vignettes of him were all, if you knew the specifics of the case, you know, him working at ADT, him being in the library, him writing letters, him burying things in the back garden. It's just very, very good, just breadcrumbs. It's the appropriate way to use him on this show yeah. when you want to talk about just how, you know, not everything's perfect for the FBI mm -hmm. right now. They're going after all these criminals. They're mm -hmm. collecting as much evidence they can. They think they got it, the profiling system down now. It's 100%, it's accurate. We know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then meanwhile, BTK's out there just living a normal life yeah. at the exact same time. He's also got another life where he's just out there killing everyone. Yeah, and I think it's it speaks to how terrifying it would be um, because you don't know who it is, you're locking your door at mm -hmm. night, but then he would come and cut your phone line. Yeah. And, you know, them not showing his actual crimes and just showing the aftermath, uh, you know, like him taking pictures of the IDs and the mementos that he would take from the crime scenes, it's way more scary. It's, it's like Jaws, right? It's, yeah. you know, it's the feeling, it's the dread. You don't necessarily have to see the monster at work. Now, going forward, Dennis doesn't murder his final victim until 1991. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, do you think they're going to bring him back for next season um, through more vignettes? I think they will, obviously. I think, because he kind of, I think they'll certainly mention him and bring him up as like the white whale that they never managed to catch. Mm -hmm. so the thing about BTK is that he keeps murdering up until about 1991, and then he goes quiet. You know, he's a family man. He has kids in real life. I think his daughter wrote a book recently. Spoiler for real life, I suppose, 
But he doesn't get caught until 2005. Five. He begins taunting the police um, after, because again, because this whole show itself yeah. about the celebrity aspect, about being famous, and now they've forgotten about him, and now he, he can't take that, so he's gotta start sending things out. Now he would resume sending letters to the police in 2004, and in his arrest in 2005 due to a floppy disk. So the best bit about that is that he actually asked the police, um, if I put something on a floppy disk, can you trace it? And I think through the paper, the police released this statement that said, no, you can't be traced uh, if you put it on a floppy disk. Put it on a floppy disk away. That's Send totally it right fine. in. Uh, and that's how they found metadata, which led them to the the congregation that he was mm -hmm. a part of. And that's how they caught him, because the last person logged onto the computer, Dennis. Now, 2005. Mm. Final season of this show, whatever it happens mm. to be. Do you think they end with his arrest? So I, are we talking about our theories for upcoming, mm -hmm. upcoming seasons? Mm -hmm. So let's jump into theories. There have been talks that Fincher has plans for five seasons. Yes. And I think that there is already a really good um, sort of framework that you can kind of see happening. So season one is all about the emergence of serial killers and mm -hmm. the fact that you know these demented minds live among us. Season two, all about celebrity. And I think in, if you go into season three, that's probably going to be the 80s, Richard Ramirez, Golden State Absolutely. Uh, killer. And then into 90s, Columbine. I feel like awful events such as Columbine. And then noughties, I think, depending on how far how forward they, they go. Do they get to the BTK killer again? I think they probably would, but also I feel like you would maybe look into things like incels. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, oh. again, it's more mass shootings, but it's in the way that people in society nowadays are adapting and changing their psychology. Remember by the 2000s, yeah. he felt, again, for BTK killer yeah. by the 2000s, he felt left out and mm -hmm. uh, the fame was fading away because at this point, terrorism's the big thing going yeah. on. So mm -hmm. he, he needs something to get back in there and yeah. that's how it leads to his arrest. Mindhunter season two ended in 1982. Mm -hmm. So the next season could theoretically start in 83, but have vignettes that take place years mm -hmm. later. Yeah. Not just with the BTK killer though, they can also have our main characters Ooh. stamped out. Because I'm thinking of season three of True Detective. This right. is what they did. Mm -hmm. They would cut from uh, present day mm -hmm. to the past and also looking forward into the future. Gotcha, that would make a lot of sense. I would love them, especially if you think about someone like Wendy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the per I mean, she could use a fast forward. I Eileen think. I think Wernos just immediately springs yeah. to mind that you would love to see. You know, Eileen is such a tragic figure, and I'm not saying that in any way to say to sympathize with her, but you know, to investigate her story and her relationships, her sexuality, her life as a prostitute, her perfect abuse. for Wendy. Yeah, it would just be really, really fascinating to see. And speaking of Wendy, let's talk about her and Charles Manson. I know he's going to come back for the next season. They're going to bring them back for probably yep. the, for the entire run from and this he was point so going forward. Good. And I think they used him very sparingly as well. Oh yeah, no, this is just the this is the kickoff. This is really just the first round, round one with him and Tench. I cannot wait to see uh, Manson and Tench back mm -hmm. together again for round two. He'll probably punch him. It's, yeah. it's fictional here, so they, this can go wherever they want. With that said, what about the rest of the family? Now the women, and this is where Wendy comes. Mm -hmm. Involved yeah. again. Do they interview the women now for the next mm -hmm. season? Because all they're focusing on are men. Men. Um, and yeah, female serial killers are very, very different. There's different. You wouldn't. You don't necessarily get female serial killers no. acting in the ways certainly that uh, the male killers that they've covered have acted. So that would be fascinating to me. So we've mentioned other killers that could potentially uh, be a part of future Mindhunter seasons. So mm -hmm. I think Richard Ramirez, and but also if you look at the way that the the arc is going, you know, the growing celebrity, mm -hmm. no one has thralls and, uh, yep. like yep. P Richard Ramirez, which was terrifying, but also Ted Bundy. He, he's so he's mentioned definitely coming up soon. But the cult of Bundy, you know. Don't watch the extraordinary, wicked, extremely vile. It's awful. However, <laughs> do look up the um, the footage at the end that they use from the actual trial, where women are going, "Oh, it couldn't have been Ted. He's too good looking." That stuff is. Terrible. 
terrifying. That and seems actually, to be the theme yeah. that could go into the next season. Yeah, and also if they did, you know, if my theory is correct, and they did bring it up to the modern age, you know, you have people like Elliot Rogers, and yeah. you know, they have these manifestos, and they're looking for fame, and they're looking to cultivate this persona as Manson did, and so that's why I think he would be a really key character for season three, because despite being just insane, he managed to get this bunch of kids to respond to him and follow him, and yeah, that's where I can see this going. They played with it a little bit with this season on race and how oh, it, it, it can't be a black guy, all these kids, why, it's gotta be the clan. Mm -hmm. Same thing here, he's a good looking guy, he can't do this, yeah. and Ted Bundy could never do anything like this. So I can definitely see Bundy coming in at some point. Don't get Zac Efron in. He's, a, he's fine, but that portrayal was... No. And as you know, this show is based off of the great retired FBI agent, Johnny Douglas. He had two major individual cases, mm -hmm. one of which was seen this season, mm -hmm. the Atlanta case. Now the other one happens to be the West Memphis Three. How do they bring that into this show? Because I feel like, yes, we've got a lot of stuff on it recently, mm -hmm. um, including Ted Bundy uh, back in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. I wonder how they're gonna tackle the West Memphis Three, and is that something that also, just like BTK, just plays yeah. out for years and years? I think so, yeah. But I think they're gonna hit on that too. I, I, I can't imagine they're gonna just leave that case alone. Yeah, because I think they, they managed to strike a really good balance between immediate gratification with finding a case and solving it, mm -hmm. but also by having these longer payoffs that feed more directly into the everyday. West Memphis I, feels yeah. like something of a longer payoff. Yeah. Um, they're guaranteed to have some cases where they, they find the bad guy at the mm -hmm. end, yeah, oh, yeah. every season. They're gonna Monster do that. Monster of the week. Oh yes, and I'm all for it. I'm ready for that too. I do love the fact that they do balance that pretty well, mm -hmm. the Monster of the Week and the fact that, uh, again, this is Chinatown. We're not gonna catch them all, folks. Bye. But with that said, West Memphis 3, I think it's coming. Okay, everyone, that's it for us over here. Let us know what you thought of Mindhunter Season 2 in the comment section down below. Now, we clearly loved the show, but I think we're both going to go watch some cute animal videos now. Yes. Get us out of this headspace. Yes. Uh, but if you want to talk about the show with us some more, feel free to stick it in the comments or come mm -hmm. find us on Twitter. I'm at Lucy James Games. I'm at GregFT155. And make sure to subscribe to GameSpot Universe for more. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.